Elections. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister think that a tax policy that brings in £55 million less than forecast is a good one? First Minister. Well, I am assuming uh, that Ruth Davidson is referring to LBTT, the, the property tax uh, that was introduced when powers transferred to this Parliament. Uh, revenues uh, raised in the most recent financial year, 2016-17, uh, were actually 14% higher than the revenues raised in the previous year. Uh, the revenues raised were, yes, indeed, lower than forecast, but that is not something that is in any way unique to Scotland. If we look, for example, at the corresponding tax in the rest of the UK, the UK stamp duty, uh, the revenue raised there was some 8% lower than the OBR forecast. Uh, these issues are mainly because it is very difficult to predict transaction taxes, but of course, the revenues raised uh, also reflect the general economic conditions, uh, property prices generally, and as the Fiscal Commission said in relation to LBTT, uh, the situation in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. Ms Davidson. I was indeed talking about LBTT, and let's go through the numbers for Scotland. Um, the Scottish Government expected £538 million to come from LBTT, and in the end, only £483 million came in, a shortfall of 55. That was, according to property experts, due to a considerable drop in activity because of this tax. Now, let's see if we can get some clarity here from the First Minister. Early in the summer, her finance secretary said this. He said, and I'll quote directly, I'm not an ideologue on this issue. We want the tax to function well. And if there's a case that an amendment of the current bans could help stimulate the housing market and the revenue it raises, then I will consider it. With a £55 million shortfall and a housing market, again, and I'll quote, in serious slowdown, hasn't that case now been made? Yeah. First Minister. Well, firstly, of course, we will bring forward our tax decisions in our budget to be scrutinised by Parliament uh, for this and for all taxes for which we are responsible. But let's get into the detail of, of Ruth Davidson's question here, because she talks about a shortfall, £483 million raised in 2016-17, as I said, was actually 14% higher than the revenues raised in the previous year. That's more revenue uh, being brought uh, into use for, for public spending. Secondly, uh, Ruth Davidson somehow wants to give the impression that uh, a, a shortfall against uh, a revenue forecast is somehow uniquely to do with the structure of the tax in Scotland. Uh, perhaps she wants to therefore explain why, as I said, on a like-for-like -like basis, there was an 8% shortfall in the rest of the UK uh, compared to the OBR forecast. But let's get into the heart of uh, the suggestions that Ruth Davidson is making, because the claim here is that this is due to the rates of tax at the top end of the property market. Uh, unfortunately for Ruth Davidson, who, as we've seen in, in recent weeks, doesn't always do her homework uh, around the issues she raises at First Minister's questions, the facts tell a, a different story. I mean, let's look at data to the end of August this year. Sales of properties between £325,000 and £750,000 are up by 14% annually. Sales above £750,000 are up by 10% annually. The monthly revenues for August of this year in both of these property brackets were at the highest levels ever since LBTT was introduced. Uh, so transactions, uh, and this is an additional bit of information just to inform uh, Ruth Davidson, transactions and revenues at the top of the market are actually maintaining their share of the overall market. So yes, uh, predicting uh, transaction tax revenue is notoriously difficult to do, uh, and that's shown not just in Scotland but south of the border. But revenues in the year we're talking about are up on the previous year, and the claims Ruth Davidson is making about the top end of the market are simply not borne out by the facts. Why can't she just concede that and perhaps do a bit more research and homework in future? Yeah. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister does excel in trying to pretend to answer a question that wasn't asked, but let's talk about homework. If the First Minister had done her homework, she would have listened to Nicola Barclay, who's the Chief Executive 
of Home for Scotland. I'm going to read out, this is quite a lengthy quote, so I hope I've got latitude from the first two short questions, presiding officer. As we have expressed in submissions to the Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament, if we are, have, are to have a healthy and well-functioning housing market, we need a tax framework that enables movement up and down all price levels. However, feedback from our members shows that the present system, which varies considerably from that south of the border, is creating significant barriers. And here's the thing, presiding officer, the SNP was warned repeatedly that this would happen. Organisations like the Scottish Property Federation made it clear that these tax rates would gum up the market and reduce revenues, and that is exactly what happened. This week, this week a specific proposal has been put on the table. A specific proposal has been put on the table this week by Homes for Scotland. They want to make it easier for families to move up the property ladder and proposing to extend the 5% ban to help them. I'll back that proposal, will she? First Minister. We will bring forward tax proposals in our budget. That's the right and proper way to proceed. Uh, but let me just pick up on a few things Ruth Davidson said there. Firstly, uh, I'm not sure what question she was asking me if it wasn't the one uh, I answered. I gave her a very, very detailed Good answer job. to her question. And the point is, and I don't want to repeat everything I've just said, uh, but what Ruth Davidson is saying here is not borne out by the facts. I've just quoted figures that show that property uh, sales, transactions in these uh, brackets at the top of the property market are not declining, as Ruth Davidson says. They are actually increasing by 14% and 10% respectively. That is an increase, not a decrease. So the whole premise uh, of Ruth Davidson's question, it seems to me, has crumbled before her very eyes. But here we get also... I think to a broader issue here, and it's one that has surfaced that discussion in First Minister questions in recent weeks. Yet again, we have day after day after day, week after week after week, Tory members coming to this chamber, sometimes declaring their business interests, sometimes not <laughs> declaring their business interests, calling for, calling for extra spending. And yet here again, we have the Tories also calling for a cut in tax for the very wealthiest in our society. The sums for the Tories simply don't add up. So firstly, uh, Ruth Davidson is wrong uh, in her central claims today. Uh, and yet again, the Tories have been found absolutely wanting. They want us to spend more, but they also want us to cut taxes. And they cannot have the best of both worlds. Ruth Davidson. I don't even know how you lot are going to pick through all of the things that weren't said that have been claimed there. <laughs> but let's go back to the numbers. Let's go back to the actual All right, numbers. order, 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 because order. The first order, Minister. Mr Swinney, please, Mr Swinney. Ms Davidson knows that you refer to the chair, not to the press gallery. Absolutely. Let's get back to the numbers, because the First Minister says that this went up, not down. But the embarrassment for the SNP is that the shortfall would have been much worse if they hadn't adopted wholesale the Tory proposal for the new surcharge on buy-to-let and second homes. So she talks about raising revenue. There was £100 million right there. That's not their idea. That was ours. So on the very first new tax administered by the government, the First Minister has got it completely wrong. Yeah. She gummed up the housing market. Yeah. She blew a £55 million hole in her own budget, which would have been three times worse if she hadn't picked up the Tory policy yeah. Yeah. on buy-to-let and second homes. Yeah. Yeah. And more importantly, and this is the important bit, she squeezed Scottish families out of their first proper home. Yeah. Does that sound like competency to her? First Minister. Well, firstly, you can always tell when Ruth Davidson is floundering at First Minister's questions when she starts hurling abuse across the chamber. Although it's, it's nothing on the abuse that was hurled at me and others by the Tory councillor, of course, who was taken off the teaching register because of her behaviour, something that Ruth Davidson probably won't want to comment on. But you know, I'm not sure what bit of this Ruth Davidson is, is struggling to understand. I, I should say, in terms of people at the bottom uh, of the housing yep. ladder, people actually looking to own their first home. We've reduced the tax burden Absolutely. because we've made LBDT more progressive than stamp duty ever was. But then, but then progressive taxes 
is something that's clearly offensive to people uh, on the Tory uh, benches. But, you know, what we've got here is a situation where LBTT revenue is up uh, compared to the year before. That's up, not down. We've got the situation where transactions at the top of the market are up, not down. Again, that's up, not down. Uh, so, you know, the, the whole premise of Ruth Davidson's question uh, here is absolutely flawed. We will continue to put forward proposals uh, that are progressive in nature, help those most in need of help at the bottom and make sure that those with the broadest shoulders uh, pay a fair share. I know that principle of progressive tax, as I say, is something that Tory benches don't like, but it's one that those of us in this bench, those be these benches, will continue to adhere to. Question number two, Alec Rowley. Presiding officer. Order, please. Presiding officer, I met a few weeks ago with a housing development company. Well, I'm going to talk about a serious issue, and I would ask that you actually give me the courtesy to do so. Presiding officer, I met a few weeks ago with a housing development company who raised with me a live application that they have for 900 new houses to be built. The developer had hoped that the application would have been determined by last Christmas, but as yet it has not. They did not complain about the planning process holding up the work. Rather, it was the lack of front-loaded capital needed to build the new £8 million school as part of the Section 75 agreement. The developer cannot afford to front load that level of investment and neither can the council. They said to me that this is not an uncommon issue and it is a real barrier to new housing development being built. Does the First Minister recognise this problem and does the government have any plans to address this and get new housing development happening across Scotland? First Minister. Well, uh, can I thank Alec Rowley for raising this issue? Uh, I'm sure he appreciates that without further detail of what particular project and application he's talking about, there, there will be a limit to what I can say in, in terms of a detailed response. If he wants to either share more detail with me today or write to me after First Minister's questions, I will make sure uh, it is properly looked into. That said, of course, if it is a, a live application, again, there will be uh, a limit to what I can say because due process has to take its course. In terms of the, the, the general issue Alec Rowley raises, though, yes, it is one I recognise and one that the Scottish Government uh, works to try to address. Uh, often uh, the limitations uh, around infrastructure when housing developments uh, are wanted to, to go ahead. Uh, that's, for example, why the Scottish Government introduced the Housing Infrastructure Loan Fund, uh, specifically designed uh, to try to deal with these limitations uh, and see the provision of the infrastructure, whether that's schools, hospitals, health services, that are often required to support new housing development. So we will continue to take action uh, to try to address these concerns. And as I said at the outset of my answer, if he wants to provide me with more detail of the particular application he's talking about, I can make sure that that is fully looked into uh, and we can consider whether there is any more the Scottish Government can do to assist. Alec Bradley. It was the general principle because I highlight one case but I'm told that it's not uncommon and that is the lack of infrastructure is holding up development. Anyway, private sector new build is one part of meeting the housing need in Scotland. However, a number of People and the number of people living in private rented sector housing has risen dramatically over the last two decades. With little regulation, rents have also shot up in this sector. The cost of rents often bears no relation to the conditions and values of the properties that the people are renting. Indeed, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation has said that the proportion of people being classed as being in poverty who live in the private rented sector has almost tripled. Does the First Minister recognise this issue? And are you willing to look at what can be done to address this, including consideration of some rent controls? First Minister. Well, of course, Alec Rowley will recall that in the most recent legislation passed by this Parliament, if memory serves me correctly, in the last session of, of Parliament legislation, it was enacted that allows action to be taken where local authorities consider that there are problems with excessive rent increases. So the Parliament has already acted uh, to introduce some form of uh, rent control uh, provision. Of course, we will always consider uh, if there is a case to go further, because as Alec 
uh, Rowley rightly says, and as we saw uh, from the household survey uh, published just this week, the numbers living in private rented accommodation are increasing, and it's important that that housing uh, remains affordable for people, but also that we take action to ensure that private rented housing uh, is of a high quality. And uh, as somebody who represents an urban constituency, I'm very well aware of the importance of both of those things. In terms of, of housing generally, uh, as I hope people across the chamber uh, would acknowledge, we are investing record sums. We'll invest £3 billion over the course of uh, this parliament uh, in creating 50,000 more affordable homes. And in terms of house building completion, uh, we're building uh, houses at a rate faster than any other part of the UK. So that's the record of this government, and we will continue to do everything we can to build upon it. Alec Rowley. And, presiding officer, I've continued to welcome what has been getting done, but clearly, given the scale of the housing issues, we need to do more. Given that we are moving towards winter, it is the poorest people in the poorest housing that face the greatest challenges. Energy Acts in Scotland has said that as many as a third of private rented sector tenants in Scotland are also living in fuel poverty, almost double the same figure as those with a mortgage. I know that the government have said they're bringing forward their Warm Homes Bill. I co-chaired a meeting with Jean Freeman and COSLA earlier this month on benefit take-up. But can I ask the First Minister what else can be done to help the poorest people in the poorest properties this winter? First Minister. Well, there's a range of things that can be done and are being done by this government. Uh, they include, for example, continuing to talk to the, the, the power companies to make sure that uh, people, particularly on the lowest incomes, uh, are given a fair and a fairer deal than has often been the case uh, in the past. Secondly, there is action, uh, continued action, to improve the energy efficiency of our housing stock. And again, this government, I think, unlike um, other governments across the UK, have invested heavily uh, in improving energy efficiency uh, standards as a large number of homes have had energy efficiency measures installed supported by uh, government uh, funding uh, and also uh, we can make sure that we've got uh, fuel, target, uh, fuel poverty targets in place uh, that are helping to address this issue. That's why the Warm Homes Bill that we committed to in the programme for government is so important. So these are all uh, vitally important issues uh, but you know as uh, I hope Alec Rowley and others would acknowledge this government is doing uh, I think uh, and I think I can say that is without fear of contradiction uh, doing much more here than any other government across the UK and we will continue to do so. A number of constituency supplementaries. Marie Goujon first. NHS Tayside are currently undertaking a consultation which could lead to the closure of the Mulberry Unit, a mental health inpatient facility in my constituency in Angus. However, I have serious concerns, as do my constituents in Angus and Aberdeenshire, though they haven't been consulted, that this consultation breaches Scottish Health Council guidance on major service changes. It offers no alternative to closure, is inaccessible and appears to be a box-ticking exercise. Will the First Minister commit to urgently investigating these concerns to ensure that NHS Tayside meets obligations to provide robust and transparent consultation? First Minister. Uh, the Health Secretary will certainly uh, relay the concerns that have just been expressed uh, to Tayside uh, Health Board. I should say, uh, in fairness, uh, concerns were raised uh, with the Cabinet when we had one of our summer Cabinet meetings in Tayside, uh, concerns about the, the nature uh, of the consultation. So we will make sure uh, those concerns are raised and the, the Health Board uh, responds to them. Uh, of course, the proposals around uh, the Mulberry Ward and Murray Royal Hospital uh, are part of a Tayside-wide review of adult mental health and learning disability services, which uh, has been led by Perth and Kinross Integrated Joint Board on behalf of the, the partnership of the three IGBs in Tayside and NHS Tayside. It's important that people have opportunities to feed in their views uh, and that people have confidence and assurance that these views are taken seriously. Uh, the consultation, of course, is not closed yet. It runs until the 3rd of October, and I would encourage everyone with an interest to feed back their views. I encourage members, including a couple of ministers at the back, to stop having conversations across the chamber. Uh, Liam Kerr. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, staying in Angus and NHS Tayside, Angus Here to Help is a local lifeline service which helps over 600 people in Angus suffering with hearing loss and helps deliver the vision outlined in the Scottish Government's Health and Social Care Delivery Plan. In March 2017, Angus Health and Social Care Partnership rejected a funding application. No other funding sources have been forthcoming. 
Angus Hare to Help needs £17,000 to survive. Without it, it will close, probably by this time next week. So please, will the First Minister urgently step in and ask that NHS Tayside save local provision by giving the service the £17,000 it requires? First Minister. Of course, I, I should point out here before I address the substance of the question that the Conservatives are part of the administration of Angus uh, Council, uh, and I would hope that these issues are being raised uh, with the, the local council. Uh, obviously, projects like the one the member talks about, though, are really important. I, I, I'm not aware of all of the details of this particular project, but given that this has been raised with me in the chamber, I will make sure it is looked into uh, and that we uh, have a relevant discussion with the council, with the IGB, and if there is anything further the Scottish Government can do to help, then we will certainly be happy to do so. Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government believes NHS Highland should take to give an assurance to the people of Skye that services for the north of the island and Portree Hospital in particular will be sustained long into the future. First Minister. Well, the Health Secretary met with the leader of Highland Council and uh, Councillor Macdonald from Skye, along with the Chair and Chief Executive from NHS Highland uh, on Thursday the 21st of September to discuss services in Portree. The Health Secretary was very clear with the Board uh, that she expects Skye to receive a high quality health service that meets the needs of all of the island. Uh, and as part of that, commitments have been received from the Board that out-of-hours cover and emergency cover at Portree Hospital uh, are remaining. Uh, the Health Secretary has also been consistently clear with NHS Highland that they must continue to meaningfully engage with local stakeholders uh, as work proceeds. Uh, and she made this clear uh, again when she met with all parties last Thursday. And Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In May this year, one of my constituents received confirmation that her 10-year-old daughter was on a waiting list to see a paediatric ENT specialist. At the end of this month, concerned that maybe the appointment had gone missing in the post, she called the Health Board, only to be told that the waiting time for such appointments was now uh, 18 to 20 months and maybe longer. Does the First Minister agree with me that nearly two years is far too long for a 10-year-old to wait to see a specialist? And, and what is the Scottish Government doing to bring down these massive and, frankly, unacceptable waiting times? First Minister. Uh, yes, I... I, I do agree and again obviously I, I don't know all of the details of this case if, if they can be passed to me then the health secretary will uh, make sure she investigates that and, and discusses that with the health board. In terms of the general part of the member's question uh, we are investing record sums in the health service. Uh, we also see record numbers of people working in our health service. Uh, we're undertaking important reforms to our health service so that as demand uh, for the NHS continues to rise, as it will do because of the ageing population, uh, we have uh, the capacity in place to deal with that. So we will continue to take action to support our national health service. Uh, and, uh, of course, if the, the details of this particular case can be passed to me, I'm happy to have them looked into. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We already know who would benefit from the Scottish Government's proposal to cut aviation taxes. 70% of flights are taken by just 15% of people. They tend to be the wealthiest. They stand to gain over £800 a year from this tax cut, while a couple taking their children on an annual holiday would only save £13. But we also know that people in Scotland understand that they won't benefit. When they were asked in an opinion poll, Fewer than one in ten people said that this tax cut would make a positive difference to their lives. The vast majority chose investment in public transport, fixing potholes and better infrastructure. And with Ryanair now being accused of persistently misleading passengers, I think most people also know that we can't really trust the airlines even to pass on the tax cut to passengers. Does the First Minister accept that people know what transport policies will meet their needs and that they don't rate this tax cut? First Minister. Well, I've uh, set out in the Chamber on many occasions previously why uh, this particular proposal uh, that the SNP government has had for uh, many years now is important in terms of uh, wider economic competitiveness, making sure that the connectivity of our country uh, supports uh, business and economic growth. In terms of specific proposals, as I said uh, on another issue to Ruth Davidson earlier on, we will of course bring forward uh, our budget proposals when we publish our draft budget later this year and Parliament will scrutinise all aspects of, of that draft budget. In terms of 
uh, ADT in particular is another issue that uh, the Finance Secretary has shared with Parliament previously uh, around uh, the Highlands and Islands exemption, where we have concerns about the state aid compatibility of the exemption previously introduced by the UK Government, and we're discussing with the UK Government how that can uh, be resolved, and we'll keep Parliament updated on that. Can I just uh, lastly, uh, of course, uh, refer to the current situation with Ryanair, uh, which is uh, deeply regrettable, and I uh, have seen serious concerns about the decisions taken by Ryanair in the last couple of days. These will cause disruption to many passengers travelling to and from uh, Scotland to London and indeed uh, to other destinations across uh, Europe. Uh, the Transport uh, Minister is writing to Ryanair uh, to pass on these concerns. There are, of course, alternative flights uh, available. Uh, but we also fully uh, support the Civil Aviation Authority launch of enforcement action because it's vital at times of disruption that airlines provide full and accurate information to passengers about the rights that they have. Patrick Harvey. The, the First Minister talks about the economic basis for her policy, but we've already seen from parliamentary scrutiny that there is no coherent evidence base for it. And it's been a bad week for the Scottish Government's transport policies in environmental terms. The Climate Change Committee has said Scotland needs more action to meet its climate change plans, and they drew particular attention to the inadequate approach to transport emissions. Aviation emissions are now 82% higher than the baseline against which everybody else is trying to cut Scotland's emissions, yet the Scottish Government wants to boost this most polluting transport mode of all. And the Fraser of Allender Institute has warned that this policy will just lead to more tax competition, a race to the bottom, and ultimately less public revenues for services everywhere throughout these islands. This policy is unwanted, unnecessary, and unsupported by any evidence. Isn't it time just to dump it once and for all? First Minister. Patrick Harvey and I have a long-standing difference of opinion on this, but as I said, we will bring forward our budget proposals in, in due course. But I do think, I'm, I'm glad Patrick Harvey mentioned uh, the report of the Climate Change Committee, because yes, uh, while it did uh, encourage us to go further and to go faster, it also said that Scotland was leading the UK and the world indeed in terms of action uh, to tackle climate change. And of course, the programme for government that I outlined in Parliament just a few weeks ago included proposals to double financial support for active travel. It, it included proposals to uh, phase out the need for new petrol and diesel vehicles uh, by 2032, eight years ahead of the target in the rest of the UK. We will later this year announce uh, the first low emission zone and we outlined plans to have uh, low emission zones in all of our major cities by 2020. So across a range of issues, we are taking action in transport that makes sure we're reducing emission and helping to meet our climate change targets as they are now uh, and in the even more ambitious targets that will be set for the future. Go for the supplementary from Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the First Minister what engagement the Scottish Government undertakes with the Scottish Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament and what position it holds on the Treaty of Nuclear Weapons, uh, Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, recently successfully passed at the United Nations. First Minister. Uh, well, I support uh, that treaty. I, I want to see a world free of nuclear weapons, and I think countries uh, like the UK should lead by example. Instead of spending tens of billions of pounds on a new generation of Trident nuclear missiles, we should be getting rid of Trident nuclear missiles uh, from uh, the Clyde. So we will continue uh, to support action for unilateral nuclear disarmament, because uh, if we see countries leading by example, then we will see uh, the world uh, a safer place in the long term uh, as a result of that. So we will uh, support action internationally from the UN uh, and elsewhere to support that, because it is uh, the right thing to do uh, morally, uh, financially, and for practical reasons as well. Question number four, Richard Lockett. Can I ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service regarding it attending medical emergencies in light of reports that trials of this service will end due to dispute over paying conditions? First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government is not a direct participant in negotiations with the Fire Brigades Union. Uh, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service 
is the employer and it conducts negotiations as part of the UK-wide National Joint Council for Fire and Rescue Services. Uh, the Minister for Community Safety last met the Chief Fire Officer and the Chair of the Fire Service on Tuesday when she shared uh, their disappointment that involvement in the medical emergency trials has been suspended and encouraged continued discussions. Uh, the Scottish Ambulance Service, of course, prioritises patients with immediately life-threatening conditions and will take all appropriate measures in those areas where the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest trial has been taking place to ensure that they continue to respond to emergencies without delay. Richard Lockhead. Can I thank the First Minister for her answer and I'm sure she'll agree that the trials have been a big success given that in their first year firefighters have made 41 potentially life-saving interventions. Is the First Minister aware of the campaign being conducted by my constituents, Mr and Mrs McCandy, who tragically lost their son Kieran last year in a road traffic accident when he was out cycling and who have since been calling for firefighters to attend medical emergencies as they can be closer to incidents uh, than the nearest ambulance and they wish to see this change of policy as part of Kieran's legacy. But understandably, they're quite rightly shocked that a pay dispute could get in the way of saving lives and they want to see the corresponding of the emergency services to all road traffic accidents. So does the First Minister therefore agree we need a solution that respects the views of the firefighters who want to continue delivering this vital service without delay and for corresponding to become standard throughout Scotland to save, in, to save even more lives? First Minister. Yes, I do agree with all of that. I am aware of the campaign by Mr and Mrs McCandy, who I think are to be greatly admired for their efforts to promote improvement to the way services respond to emergency incidents following the tragic loss of their son. And I agree wholeheartedly that uh, the emergency medical trials are an excellent example of public services working more closely together to achieve a common aim and improve the service <coughs> that is provided to the public. As I said in my previous answer, the Community Safety Minister has encouraged continued uh, discussions on pay. Uh, we want to see uh, our fire service workers uh, paid appropriately. Uh, I am aware that the Chief Fire Officer has written uh, a letter to fire service staff asking that discussions continue on a proposal that is in the best interests of firefighters and communities. So I would encourage all sides uh, to do everything they can to show that, show that this issue can be resolved without further delay. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Could the First Minister provide details on the operational budget provided to Scotland's fire and rescue services? First Minister. Well, there has been an increase, uh, as I, I think I, I said in the Chamber at First Minister's questions last week or the week before, in the resource budget uh, for the fire and rescue services. Uh, I think, if memory serves me correctly, of uh, around £20 uh, million. Pounds. Um, and we will continue to make sure that we support our, our frontline firefighters. They do an outstanding job on behalf of all of us. And it is right that the service uh, is appro appropriately supported and also that firefighters are given the rewards that they deserve. Question number five, Donald Cameron. <clears throat> to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Committee on Climate Change's report, Reducing Emissions in Scotland 2017 Progress Report. First Minister. Well, I welcome the committee's report, which recognises that Scotland's ambition on climate change is amongst the highest in the world. It also recognises our strong progress to date with statutory targets met for the second consecutive year and uh, notes that we continue to lead the UK. We will, of course, take time to reflect fully on the committee's report as we finalise the climate change plan for publication early next year. We know that even more needs to be done to continue meeting our challenging targets. And that's why the programme for government sets out bold new commitments in areas such as low carbon transport, infrastructure and energy efficiency. Donald Cameron. I thank the First Minister for her answer. It's already been pointed out today that around a third of households in Scotland are in fuel poverty. In light of this, and given the fact that a week ago Parliament marked Scottish Housing Day, will the First Minister commit to Scottish Conservative proposals to ensure that every home in Scotland achieves an EPC rating of C or above by 2030? First Minister. Well, we will continue to take action to improve uh, energy efficiency of our housing stock across all tenures, and we set out further ambition on that in the programme for government. But yet again, you know, going back to what I said to Ruth Davidson, this sounds very much like, yet again, the Tories coming to this chamber and calling on us to spend more money, while at the same time calling for tax cuts for the richest in our society. The Tories increasingly have no credibility whatsoever on any of these issues, and while this contradictory stance continues to be their position, that credibility will continue to sink. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The agriculture sector is also a heavy greenhouse gas emitter. 
the UK CCC's report said, and I quote, there's been little recent progress in reducing agricultural emissions. And yet again said that, I quote again, the Scottish Government should look again at going beyond the voluntary approach. I'm a member of the Eclair Committee, and we said that the compulsory soil testing is a vital step a vital stepping stone in changing behaviours on farms and should be in the final climate change plan. In my view, this should be introduced with support, building on good practice in the agriculture sector. So will it be in the final plan, First Minister? And does the First Minister agree that each minister should be answerable to Parliament for changes in their portfolio in the context of this vital issue? First. Well, let me uh, respond to just a couple of points in, in that question. Firstly, uh, in terms of soil testing in the agriculture sector, of course that is, is hugely important. The agriculture sector will play a big part in helping us to meet our climate change targets. It is important, I think, to point out, though, that there is currently a high take-up of soil testing voluntarily uh, from those within the agriculture sector. And obviously, as we uh, go forward, we need to continue to do more to encourage uh, that take-up to increase uh, even further. Secondly, in terms of what I think is a fair point about the responsibility across government uh, for meeting our climate change targets, the Environment Secretary has uh, principal responsibility around the Cabinet table, but she cannot do that without the support of every other member of the government, and we should be accountable, uh, each and every one of us, uh, within uh, our own portfolio areas, which for me includes every portfolio area, obviously, um, in terms of the contribution that they make, and accountable to Parliament and to the wider public. We will only meet these targets if we take the action required uh, across our electricity and wider energy sector, uh, our transport sector, which Patrick Harvey has just been raising, and of course the agriculture sector uh, as well. The final point I would make uh, relates to the, the, the question about the climate change plan. Uh, we will publish the final climate change plan early next year. We have consulted on that and uh, are considering uh, the responses and the consultations. So I'm not going to say right now what is going to be in the final climate change plan because we have to go through due process on that. Uh, but I can give an assurance to Parliament that climate change plan will be ambitious so that we can meet the current targets uh, that we have set. That's what this climate change plan is about. But of course, we also have the forthcoming climate change bill, which is all about setting even more ambitious targets for us to meet. So we continue to lead not just the UK, but the world uh, in terms of our uh, ambition here. And it's a responsibility for all of us to make sure that the action we are taking allows us to meet that ambition in the years ahead. Emma Harper. Can the First Minister provide detail on how long-term emission reductions in Scotland compare to the rest of the UK? And does she agree that Scotland continues to be considered a leader in tackling climate change? First Minister. Well, we continue to outperform the rest of the UK in delivering long-term emissions reductions. Uh, the most recent statistics show that Scottish emissions are down 37.6% from baseline levels. That compares to 35.4% for the UK as a whole. Uh, amongst the EU15 countries, only Sweden and Finland have done better than Scotland. Uh, with sustained progress against world-leading targets and a commitment, as I was just saying, to strengthening these further with a new bill uh, in direct response to the Paris Agreement, Scotland is at the very forefront of international climate action. Uh, our leadership on this issue has been widely recognised, including by the head of the UN climate body uh, and the chair of the UK's Independent Committee on Climate Change. And I think it's something we should all be proud of, while, of course, continuing to challenge ourselves to go even further. Question six, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the First Minister whether <coughs> the Scottish Government will give a commitment in this week, the week of International Day of Older Persons, that eligibility criteria for the National Concessionary Travel Scheme will not change during the current parliamentary session. First Minister. Well, we will continue to ensure that our national concessionary travel scheme uh, benefits those who rely on free bus travel. Uh, that is indeed why we are asking people across Scotland for their views on how best to ensure that the bus pass is sustainable for the long term. The current consultation is just that, it's a consultation. No decisions will be made until all responses have been fully considered. But whatever the outcome, let me be clear, nobody's bus pass will be taken away from them. And indeed, some people who don't currently qualify for a bus pass now will do so in the future. Richard Leonard. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? In a programme for government, it's true that there is a commitment to continuing the concessionary travel scheme uh, introduced by a Labour-led Scottish executive. However, that, co however, that commitment 
is qualified with the phrase, and I quote, whilst ensuring the scheme is sustainable in the longer term. Will the First Minister confirm today that there will be no raising of the qualifying age, no administrative charges implemented, no one-off payment required, no means testing, and no other barrier introduced that will prevent all of those aged 60 and over from accessing the scheme? First Minister. Well, I know Scottish Labour have somewhat lost touch with reality, but is Richard Leonard really suggesting that we should have a scheme in place that is not sustainable for the long term. It's because we value the bus pass scheme, because we want to see it continue to benefit people right across Scotland, that we're having this consultation to make sure it is sustainable for the long term and people long into the future can continue to enjoy the benefits of it. And that really is the difference between the SNP and Labour. We fight for Scotland. Scottish Labour just fights amongst themselves. <laughs> I mean, yesterday, it was incredible yesterday, wasn't it? We had Richard Leonard accused by Jackie Bailey of betraying every value that Labour holds dear. And then we had Richard Leonard saying that this was just the latest Jackie Bailey. Is this First Minister? I can't actually First Minister. see it, presiding officer. Let's just say it's a description that covers much of what Jackie Bailey says First in Minister, this chamber. The question is about national integrity. Presiding officer, first. the serious issue. The serious issue is this. This government continues to take the decisions that are in the interests of the people of Scotland. And by contrast, Scottish Labour's behaviour is selfish and self-indulgent, and it proves they're not fit to be an opposition, let alone a government. James Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I say I'm delighted that the First Minister has confirmed that all those who currently have a bus pass will continue to receive one. But can she, she also confirm to me that uh, those who obtain one before any changes may be made will continue to receive it? And could she update me, the Parliament, as to what the current to total number is of older and disabled people benefiting from free travel with the National Entitlement Card and how this compares to when this government entered office after a Labour executive in place? First Minister. First Minister. Well, there are thousands of people across Scotland benefiting from this scheme and we want to make sure that they continue to benefit from this scheme. And of course, as well as uh, giving the guarantee that everybody who has a bus pass, everybody who gets a bus pass before the end of this consultation will continue to have their bus pass, we've also uh, set out plans to extend eligibility to uh, apprentices as well, to young people making their way in the world to help them uh, with the cost of travel as well. So this government will continue to protect schemes like this that are about helping people across the country. And that is in stark contrast to a Tory party that's all about tax cuts for the rich and a Labour Party that only wants to fight amongst itself. Mike Rumbles. Mike Rumbles. Is the First Minister aware of Rosanna Cunningham's statement just yesterday when she said that, and I quote, encouraging behaviour change to move people out of cars and into efficient and low emission buses will help reduce both congestion and emissions at the same time? So this is a win-win situation for everybody. Uh, are the government's environmental and transport strategies aligned and are we getting joined up government here with these two? Yes, is the short answer to that. Obviously, I'm very well aware of uh, Rosanna Cunningham's statement yesterday. I have to say I thought it was an excellent uh, statement yesterday, setting out the action we are taking uh, in the transport sector to help meet our climate change obligations. Uh, indeed, uh, I think today or, or very shortly, we will announce additional funding through the Green Bus Fund, which is helping to ensure that we have low emissions buses uh, on, on our, our roads as well. Uh, it is absolutely right, and for once, and it is a rare occasion, I, I concede, I agree with Mike Rumbles, that getting people out of cars, out of cars and into buses is one of the most important things we can do to reduce congestion and of course uh, to lower emissions. It's why uh, the bus pass scheme is so important, but it's also why all of the other action I've spoken about around electric vehicles, low emission zones, doubling the active travel budget are also so important as well. 
Thank you. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We now have members' business in the name of Richard Leonard. And we'll just take a few moments for our members to change seats.